Hello, welcome back. I'm Jason, and today we're going to talk about a deep space astronomical object that, no kidding, totally serious, astronomers actually thought originally might be an alien civilization when it was first discovered in the 1960s. Today, we're diving into the fascinating world of pulsars. Now, these mysterious cosmic lighthouses were once thought to be signals from aliens. That's right, when they were first discovered, they were actually nicknamed Little Green Men, or LGM for short, because their signals were so regular and so precise. Now, in fact, the first few that were discovered were called LGM-1 and LGM-2 and so on. So let's unravel this cosmic mystery and learn about the true nature of pulsars and why they captivated the scientific community and the public alike. Now, our story begins in the mid-1960s at the University of Cambridge. Anthony Hewis, a Jewish professor of radio astronomy, was leading a team to study quasars, which are extremely bright and extremely distant objects believed to be powered by supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies. Now, quasars are by themselves incredible and awesome and very, very interesting. Quasar stands for quasi-stellar radio source. And to observe these incredible objects in detail, they needed a powerful and very sophisticated radio telescope. Let me just say that when, as you and I go outside and look into the night sky, we see the beautiful tapestry and the little dots of light everywhere, right? But actually, the visible spectrum is a tiny, tiny fraction of what's actually going on up there. The only reason we see this very narrow band of light, you know, blues and reds and things like this, is because we evolved on Earth, and our sun is bathing us in these frequencies all the time. Of course, the sun is emitting other wavelengths as well, and when you look out into space, even planets like Jupiter and, of course, deep sky objects are emitting lots of energy in radio waves, gamma rays, all other frequencies of the electromagnetic spectrum. And as you know, visible light is just a very tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the electromagnetic spectrum. That's just what we can see. So often, astronomers are studying the cosmos in other frequencies because other frequencies of radiation can penetrate dust clouds and other obstructions. You can actually see in many cases more detail in what you're studying, not by looking in visible light, but by looking in other sources. And as they started doing this, as they started going out and looking into deep space, they started discovering these very crazy uh, deep space objects emitting lots and lots of energy in radio and in other frequencies, quasars being one, pulsars we're gonna talk about in just a second. And just to put a point on it here, you can't really go down to Walmart or Target or your local big box retailer and just buy a telescope to study radio waves. You have to build it yourself. So when astronomers were doing this, they were actually hand winding and hand stringing these very large arrays, very large antennas to study these longer wavelengths which are out in deep space. So they were building the telescopes that they were using to observe the universe. Now, building this enormous telescope was no small feat in and of itself. It spanned four and a half acres. That's huge. Covered 2,000 dipole antennas, and they were connected by 120 miles of wire and cable. Now, forgive the English units, but whether you're talking about miles or kilometers, I think you can get the scale of these telescopes. They have to be physically larger because the wavelengths of the light that they were looking at are physically larger. That's kind of one of the rules of science. When you're looking at very small wavelengths, you can get away with a small detector. When you have very long wavelengths, sometimes the wavelengths are kilometers long for radio waves, you need a physically large detector or you can't see anything. Now, light is actually a pretty small wavelength and that's why our eyeballs are able to be pretty small. But for these uh, deep sky objects, you have to have physically large receivers. Now, when you see the word dipole, don't get scared off by that. That's very similar to what you used to see on car antennas. Nowadays, they're all tucked into other places, but you used to see the long antenna sticking up from the hood of the car. That's a dipole. It's basically uh, two wires there, essentially. The other one is, is hidden from view. You see the, the top one there pointing out of the hood there. That's a dipole, just like die, the prefix die means two. 
Now, building this thing was more than a one-person job, so Hewish enlisted the help of a bright and dedicated graduate student named Jocelyn Bell. Now, Bell and her team spent two grueling years constructing this colossal antenna, this colossal instrument. And when it finally became operational in July of 1967, Bell took on the daunting task of analyzing the immense amount of data that it produced. Every single day, she pored over 100 feet of paper readouts, meticulously examining the signals recorded by the telescope. One day, a few weeks into her research, Bell noticed something peculiar, a bit of scruff, quote unquote, in the data. Unlike the noise and interference they typically dealt with every day, this signal was consistent and regular, coming from the same place in the night sky. Intrigued by this, Bell shared her findings with Hewish. The data that she had indicated a series of sharp pulses occurring every 1.3 seconds, something absolutely unprecedented and never seen before. These pulses were so regular and so precise that Bell and Hewish initially considered the possibility of a man-made source, such as satellite interference. However, they ruled this out quickly and ruled out other potential sources of man-made signals. They were left with an exciting and perplexing mystery. Now, I know that none of us are real astronomers here, right? But I think you could put yourself in their position. You take these radio telescopes, you point them at the sun, lots of radio uh, waves there. But notice that most of the time it's noise. It's essentially like static, random frequencies, random amplitudes. It sounds like static if you could hear it, right? You point the telescope at Jupiter, you get similar situation. You point it in deep space, maybe there's less of it, but what signal you do get is generally noise. Suddenly you point it at an object in the sky and you're not hearing noise anymore. You're hearing regular, regular repeating pattern, not the static of noise, but some sort of boop, 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 very repeatable. Now I'm using my mouth to make an audible frequency, right? But they're not hearing anything. They're just seeing the regular pulses in the radio data at a specific frequency. So of course they're gonna think some kind of like man-made situation, either a satellite or something else, but continue to keep in mind that back then there weren't that many satellites in the sky. They quickly eliminated that by doing the observations at different times of the year and things of this nature. But put yourself in that position. You would probably wonder if it was aliens yourself, right? This is kind of an exciting prospect to think about. Now, they were tickled by this, of course they were excited as well, and they nicknamed the signal LGM-1 for Little Green Men, half seriously contemplating the real idea of extraterrestrial communication. Bell later recalled wondering, if one thinks of this as a transmission, what other explanation could there be? But the story didn't really end there. Soon, Bell discovered another similar signal coming from a totally different part of the sky. And if it's coming from a different part of the sky, that would mean that it would be a totally different alien civilization. And the idea of multiple alien civilizations trying to contact Earth at the same time seems so highly unlikely. So Bell and Hewish began searching for another natural explanation. And by the end of 1967, they identified a total of four similar signals behaving in the same way. They ruled out the extraterrestrial hypothesis, leading to a need for a new natural explanation. Enter the astrophysicist Thomas Gold from Cornell University. Gold proposed that these signals might be coming from rapidly rotating neutron stars, which are extremely dense remnants of supernova explosions. Now, neutron stars are absolutely fascinating all by themselves. When a star exhausts its nuclear fuel, it collapses under its own gravity. The outer layers of the star are blown off in a supernova explosion while the core compresses into an incredibly dense neutron star. Neutron stars have a mass comparable to that of the sun, but they're only about 20 kilometers in diameter. The density is so extreme that a single teaspoon of a neutron star, if you could scoop it out with a teaspoon, would weigh around a billion, with a B, tons. Now we just have to talk about this for a few minutes here. Inside of the star, obviously it's very uh, complex situation. You have fusion going on, generating a lot of heat in the core of the star. So this heat exerts pressure, that's outward pressure, literally trying to blow the star apart because you literally have, think about a nuclear explosion all the time in the center of the star. The star is trying to explode as an outward pressure. 
So what continues to keep it from exploding? Well, the star is large. It has a lot of gravity. The gravity is pulling on it, holding it together. So there's always this balance inside of even our own star. It wants to explode, but gravity is holding it together. There's a balance or an equilibrium. Now, when we get to the end of the star's life, the nuclear fuel begins to be exhausted. And on the inside, there's not as much energy being produced. And so there's not as much pressure on the inside. You can think of the candle just kind of slowly being extinguished on the inside. But the gravity is still pulling it together. So what happens is when a star gets to the end of its life, depending on its mass, it can go different directions. And this is not a whole lecture in that. But basically, if you think about it, if you have an inward pressure from gravity, and then you have uh, pulling the star in, and then you have an outward kind of force because of the nuclear reactions, when the nuclear reactions die off, then the star is going to want to contract. Eventually, you can get this rebounding of ha like, a, like a, a contraction and then a rebound situation, and eventually it becomes unstable, and then a supernova can happen, which is an explosion of the star. Now, mostly what happens in the supernova explosion is that the outer layers of the star is what is blown off, and you're left behind with some sort of core that's left behind. And in the case of a neutron star, the reason they're called neutron stars is because the protons and the electrons, remember, this is a plasma. So these atoms that are inside the star, they're all ionized, and the electrons are all ripped off from the atoms anyway. So what happens is the, the collapse happens so violently that the electrons and the protons of the atoms fuse together. And when you study nuclear physics, that makes a neutron. And so they basically get converted to a neutron material, which then gets compressed very, very, very tightly. And that's why it's so dense that we say that the core of a neutron star would be like our sun being squeezed down to something like 20 or 30 kilometers in diameter. Think about how huge our sun is, compressing all that mass down. The reason it's compressed so much is because, as you know, in atoms we say that you can think of an atom being mostly empty space. Well, we take that empty space away by forcing the electrons in fusing and combining with the protons making neutrons, and what you have is a very dense, dense material left over. Now here's the crazy part. If what is left behind after the supernova explosion, the core of it, is about three solar masses or greater, three times the mass of our sun or greater, then what happens is it becomes a black hole because the gravity of what is left over is so strong that it can actually overcome the resistance of those neutrons from combining in on themselves. And so it becomes a black hole. And so you might then ask yourself, okay, well, if we take a normal star and it explodes and then the center of it becomes a neutron star, it fuses into neutrons, then what happens if we have a big neutron star and it collapses into a black hole? What do the neutrons become once they've been kind of fused together for lack of a better word? And the answer is, drum roll, we don't know right? Because our theories of physics predict up to that point, but we don't have a theory of physics that's going to exactly predict that. So that's why we say the black hole becomes a singularity. The singularity doesn't really mean that it punches a hole into another dimension or something. It might do that. We have no idea. But what the singularity really means is that our theories of physics don't work. Because if you remember back from algebra, sometimes you can have equations that have infinities in them, right? And you graph it and it goes up and blows up to infinity. When we take our theories and try to extend it into the realm of what happens in that black hole, then we often get infinities. So we don't know exactly what happens, but we know that it becomes a massive object so much that light can't escape through the event horizon, and we call that a black hole. So let's get back to neutron stars, right? They're not black holes. We can see them. They're neutron stars. Now, these neutron stars rotate at incredible speeds, some of them up to several hundred times per second, hundreds of times per second. Now, due to their strong magnetic fields, they emit beams of electromagnetic radiation from their magnetic poles. And as the star spins, these beams literally sweep across space like the beams of a lighthouse. And one of these beams, if they happen to cross the path of Earth, Earth, we detect that as a pulse of radiation at regular intervals. And that's what a pulsar is. 
So literally, you can think of these pulsars as like cosmic lighthouses. They are stars which have undergone some sort of supernova explosion. The core is very, very small, very, very dense, and rotates very, very fast. And they have magnetic fields, and so when they rotate, they're sending out electromagnetic radiation, often radio and other similar frequencies like this. And if we happen to be looking at exactly the right point in space, where when this thing rotates, the pole, because it's like a beam that comes out, it's not in all directions, it's a beam. And if that beam sweeps across our path from our vantage point, we see it as a boop, 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 like this, like a regular pulsing. So there are many, many, many more pulsars in the sky that we don't see because if we were to look over there and one of them is rotating so the, the beam is going where it's not intersecting Earth, we would never see it, right? We might see the star itself, but we would never see the radio pulse that hits us. So pulsars are actually very common and all over the place. And we just don't see them because they're not lined up with us. So this hypothesis made a lot more sense than the Little Green Men, and it was spectacularly confirmed in 1968 with the discovery of the Crab Pulsar in the Crab Nebula, a well-known supernova remnant. Now the Crab Pulsar emitted signals exactly as Gold's theory predicted, cementing the idea that these mysterious signals were natural phenomena. Now, pulsars are truly remarkable cosmic objects. Their regularity makes them some of the most precise clocks in the universe, rivaling even atomic clocks. Now, the fastest pulsars, known as millisecond pulsars, can spin up to 716 times per second. The slowest ones, even the really slow ones, on the other hand, emit only one pulse every 23 and a half seconds. This incredible precision has led scientists to propose actually using pulsars for spacecraft navigation, providing a natural and reliable way to guide missions through deep space. Now, fast forward to today. We now know of over 2,000 pulsars in the sky, each telling their own story of the life and death of stars. While they may not be signals from little green men, pulsars remain one of the most intriguing and valuable and fascinating objects in the cosmos. So I want to conclude here by just thanking you for taking the time to hang out with me today on this cosmic journey through the history of the science of pulsars. From their initial discovery to their role in advancing our understanding of the universe, pulsars are a testament to the power of curiosity and the wonders of the cosmos. Until next time, I'm Jason signing off. I'd like you to please drop me a comment. Let me know what you think. Do you like the material? Do you want me to go more detail, less detail? I read every single comment. Until next time, keep your eyes on the skies and always remember to stay curious. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.